When I arrived at the studio that first day, everything seemed so different. The lights seemed bigger, the cameras were enclosed, there were sound trucks on the street. I made up very early in the morning, although I didn't have to work until afternoon. I've got a shot of myself here all dressed up, coming out of my dressing room. Here I am. No, 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 that's another vaudeville actor who went into motion pictures, Cary Grant. There I am. The biggest thing on the lot at that moment was Rudy Valley making his first movie, The Vagabond Lover. There he is on the set with Sally Blaine. She was in a lot of pictures. Here's a shot I got of the whole cast rehearsing a scene. Watch as the camera pans over. This great lady was making her first talkie at this moment, Marie Dressler. She was a great comedian. There she is rehearsing just before a take. This was the final fade out of the picture and I left it in to show you what a great sense of humor this Sally Blaine has. Now keep in mind, she had just been kissed by the number one lover of the world. Watch her face. But Valley wasn't the only Rudy who made the flapper's heart flutter in the roaring 20s. Three years before, it was Rudolph Valentino. I didn't take this picture, it was taken the year before I arrived in Hollywood. Not too long after the Latin lover was gone, his throne was occupied by America's boyfriend, Buddy Rogers. And then Buddy in the 30s was to turn over his throne to a man who remained king until he died. This is one of the earliest known shots of Clark Gable. Of course, when you talk about the conquest of feminine hearts of that era, you can't leave out this guy, Marie Chevalier. Here he is on the set with Baby Leroy. Chevalier is an old friend, and I have a lot of shots of him, a great many of them with his arm in a sling. There he is with Allison Skipworth and our old friend Dick Allen. I never did know exactly how he hurt his arm, so recently I wrote him a letter to find out. You know, I thought it might be something real intriguing, like maybe he was climbing a balcony and some fair damsel slammed a window on his arm. But it wasn't anything as intriguing as that. I have the letter here, it's from Sicily. And it says, Dear Ken, I will be very happy to be among the friends who will appear in your Hollywood intimate story. At the time of the black sling, I had a broken collarbone. It happened one night when returning to Hollywood after an important preview out of town. And my car, met by another car, made a somersault, with a lucky result of being just slightly hurt. Yeah, lucky not only for him, but for a whole generation that might have been deprived of a great talent. A man who's certainly become a legend during his lifetime. Another reason I dropped him a line was I wanted permission to use a piece of film of his. His screen test. Marie Chevalier's screen test. And to my knowledge, it's the first time he ever sang Louise. We have it, and I'm going to run it. And for the benefit of those who don't know how they conduct a screen test, this is what is known as a clapboard. And a fellow holds it up in front of the camera like this, and he says, test, Chevalier, take one. Every little breeze seems to eat her Louise. Birds in the trees seem to tweet her Louise. It's Peter all. Tell me it knows I love you. Love you. Every little beat that I feel in my heart seems to repeat what I felt at the start. It's little sign. Tell me that I adore you, Louise. Just to see and hear you is joy I never knew. But to be so near you thrills me through and through. Anyone can see why I wanted your kiss. It had to be, but the wonder is this. Can it be true? Someone like you could love me, Louis. Every little brain seems to whisper, Louise. Birds in the trees seem to whisper, Louise. <laughs> Each little rose tells me it knows I love you. I love you. Every little bit that I feel in my heart seems to repeat what I felt at the start. Each little sigh tells me that I adore you, Louise. 
just to see and hear you. <laughs> it's joy. I never knew. But to be so near you thrills me through and through. Anyone can see who I want and your kiss. It has to be, but the wonder is this. Can it be true? Someone like you could love me. great impact on Hollywood in the 30s. Sunday night on the ether waves could mean only one thing. Edgar Bergen and his two alter egos, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. And some of the most exciting moments of these Sunday night shows were when this gentleman tangled with Charlie McCarthy in radio's most famous feud, W.C. Fields. I took this picture outside of his dressing room at Universal Studio. It's one of my prized possessions. I got to know Bill very well over a period of years, and contrary to the general impression that feels with an irascible old codger, I found him to be a lovable, kindly gentleman. Thanks to radio, this fellow also came to Hollywood. Bing Crosby is a real old friend. In fact, he sang at my wedding. I've got a lot of pictures of Bing through the years. Here's one in front of his dressing room when he was making his first movie. Here he is on the set of an early talkie, directed by David Butler. Alan Jocelyn was in that picture, too. Also, El Brindell. Incidentally, I think that Bing, probably more than anyone else, helps to popularize golf in the movie colony. Here he is with that great golf pro, Jimmy Thompson. That's Viola Dana, a big star in the silence. Watch Bing take his right hand off the club and put it back on before he hits the ball. John Barrymore was also practicing that day. And here's another young lady who enjoyed a swing around the links, Jean Hollow. Those bell-bottom slacks certainly tab the era, don't they? I took up golf myself in the late 30s. This was my first celebrity tournament. And man, I was really nervous. Of course, those hecklers didn't help. You'll notice that I have a swing that's neat, but not gaudy. I had a big gallery with me that day. Maybe my partner had something to do with it, old Ski Knows. That hope is the luckiest man on a golf course. Where do you see this putty makes? Look, it doesn't go in the front way. It doesn't go in the side. It comes around the back and goes in. And he's so snide about it. Of course, in the early 30s, polo was a very popular game. I used to live right above the Riviera Polo Field, and every Sunday I got a chance to take some exciting pictures. Will Rogers was responsible for spearheading the popularity of this game, and he attracted some of the biggest personalities of the movie colony as teammates. On this particular day, Leslie Howard was playing. That's Carol Lombard with Russ Colombo. Will Rogers, of course, was the big attraction. Here he is making a goal. I used to practice a little stick and ball myself. Never great, but I got so that at least I could hit the ball. Of course, it's much easier if there's no opposing team trying to stop you. But I never got to play like these fellas. From right to left, that's Johnny Mac Brown, Spence Tracy, Will Rogers, Leslie Howard, and James Gleason receiving the winning trophies from Carol Lombard. Tennis has always been popular in Hollywood. Here's Bob Cummings. You know, he's quite a health addict. I read his bestseller titled, How to Stay Young and Vital, but I must have skipped some of the pages. I don't look like that. This was taken at the Racquet Club in Palm Springs. 
I don't think there is any place in the entire world where the stars relax as much as they do at this desert spa. Here's a little horseplay between Edgar Bergen and Spence Tracy. Nice guy. Another very popular sport in the 30s was badminton. This was taken at Dick Powell's home. I took a crack at this game, too. In fact, I took a crack at everything. I think I read someplace once that you weren't really in the Hollywood swim until you've been pushed into your own swimming pool with your clothes on. So here's my next door neighbor, Mary Astor, obliging. Whoop. I promise you, this was not rehearsed. You know who took this picture? America's number one pinup girl, Betty Grable. Back in the pool, Betty. I've got to get some pictures of you now. Naturally, some of the best film I have was taken on vacation trips. One summer, Glenn Ford flew a party of friends up to Sealy Lake, Montana. This is the most beautiful spot I've ever seen. Here's a couple of Isaac Waltons who made a bet on who's going to land the first lunker. That's Sonny Tufts. You know, this is home movies at its best. I'm sure that everyone who takes pictures has a shot like this. Scenes like this seem to capture a delightful, carefree quality that is almost impossible to get in the studio. This was taken at a nearby Indian reservation. Incidentally, this next shot was photographed by Glenn. That's, uh, that's Charlie Ruggles doing the Cheyenne cha-cha with a squaw. Sonny Tuff says it's time to go, but Glenn wants to shoot the Indians just once more. Van Heflin was up there making a picture. Here he is rehearsing a scene. His wife, Frances, was there watching her husband emote. Ward Bond was also in the picture. And of all things, Boris Karloff was playing an Indian. Susan Hayward was a feminine star, and boy, did she have it rough. This is not a heated swimming pool in the studio. This is the real thing. But we all got a lot of good pictures, Charlie Ruggles, Glenn. In fact, even the Indians got good pictures. Later that summer, I took a trip to Catalina on John Hall's boat. You know, John is an expert swimmer. was aboard. He's a lot of fun and a good sailor. When we arrived at Catalina, the first one we ran into was Lou Costello with his new boat, an 80-foot cruiser. Lou certainly enjoyed that boat. Imagine trying to explain to a fish who's on first. Errol Flynn was over on the island. You know what he's pointing at? His new boat, the Zaka, coming in to pick him up. On the way home, man, did that channel get rough. I have a shot here, it's a trick shot, but it shows exactly how my stomach felt.
Yes, I was the first of the sick comedians. Probably the reason I have such a warm spot for my hometown is that in the 40s, Hollywood afforded me the opportunity of establishing some sort of record in my chosen profession, the stage. From 42 to 49, I had a show called Blackouts, which was literally the playground of the stars. Yeah, we played to everybody, from the old master D.W. Griffith to the elusive Greta Garbo, who sneaked in one night after the show started and sat in the balcony. I met a lot of friends during that time, and I got a lot of good pictures. lady was the luscious pinup girl, Marie Wilson. To the six million people who saw the show, one of the most popular acts seemed to be this movie dog, Daisy, canine star of the Blondie series and her five puppies. Here's part of the act, exactly as it was done on the stage of Blackouts for over seven years. The idea was to try to make all the puppies sit up at the same time. And as Frank Sinatra would say, this was a guess. Well, anyway, this is the way it's supposed to look when it's finished. 